I'm Rachel Barbeau, and this is Sunday Soul. It's that slice of goodness on a Sunday that uh, may easy like Sunday morning. Make <laughs> you think about brunch with somebody special, somebody you like, that relaxing on the couch after church, that good feeling on Sunday. And I am so glad right now to be joined by Mike Tolbert, um, former NFL star and businessman now making it uh, entrepreneur, business starter, dream maker. Mike, how are you? I'm doing well, Rachel. I appreciate you for having me. I'm ready to get, get started with this Sunday soul, you know, get this, get this spirit moving today. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. What is, you, listen, you're a family man. Mm -hmm. You are a, uh, a proud papa. I asked you yesterday, I was like, send me a picture for promotion. That was a picture with you and your kids. Uh, that Sunday feeling, man, what is, uh, you know, you played on Sundays, right? Mm -hmm. Like the dream, like that. Tell me about that Sunday feeling for you. Well, that Sunday feeling for me has always been um, more or less like a, a, a moment of Zen, you know, kind of just being able to enjoy it. So I, I, I'm, I'm a big believer, obviously in Jesus Christ, but I'm a big believer in, that Sunday is a day that you reflect on on life, on everything that's going on. And um, what better feeling is to be able to have your kids with you, my wife, you know, my mom's up here in town now. So this Sunday is going to be very special for me. Mike, when did you know you were going to play on Sundays? You know, because that's I work with athletes all over the country right. with, with I'm changing the narrative. And, you know, 99.99999% of my football players that work with, with all kinds of athletes, but their dream is to play on Sunday. When did you know that you know that you, when did you know, like, I'm going to play on Sundays? Like, I, I'm good enough to play on Sundays. Well, I, I knew, I would say my junior year in college, you know, I was always, I'm not going to say, not try to, well, you know, pat myself on the back, but I've always been pretty good at football. But my junior year in college, there was a scout there Look to look at uh, some other seniors that we had. And it was a Dallas Cowboys scout. And I remember him saying, telling my head coach, when my head coach told him that I was the best football player on our team, my head, uh, he told the head coach, nobody wants a 5'9", 240-pound fullback. Like, most people, they'll put a chip on their shoulder. But for me, that was recognition because they knew who I was. Mm. You know, they knew who I was. They knew about me. But they was already doubting me. So I knew from that point on that they weren't going to stop me. Yeah. Uh, t almost 2,700 yards in the NFL, uh, almost 2,000 receiving yards, 46 touchdowns, three Pro Bowls. Mm -hmm. um, do you have like a wall in your house that's dedicated to, to all the things you accomplished in the NFL? Um, I don't have – I've got like five walls. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to turn this around and show you something. Okay. Like – Oh, I love it. Game balls. I got jerseys. I've got uh, helmets from different players from, like, swapping. And this, I've got a lot of, a lot of memorabilia. So. Yeah. I mean, it's fun, though, because everybody does it. You know what I mean? Yeah. You know, it's, it's interesting. I, I heard you say in one interview, and I thought it was really great, when you left the NFL, uh, and you likened it to, like, the, I think it was the power being off in your house, and, like, you were in the dark, and you likened – leaving the NFL and getting into the business world and going that next phase of your life, um, you likened it to, to being in the dark. And I thought it was so great. And I wanted to bring it up today because um, one of the things I've been talking to male athletes about across the country for the past four years is, is baby, you are more than just a football player. You were born to do more than just play sports and die. If that's all you were born for, then what a shame you know, your life is, and you were born for so much more. And so I think so much with our athletes, particularly football players, is just say identity issues exist because a lot of them tell me, hey, man, where I come from, you know, I'm, I'm told I'm only good for football as fast as I can run, how hard as I can hit, how tight I can throw a spiral. And they tell me with tears in their eyes, Mike, they tell me, thank you for reminding me that I have worth outside of football. And so I feel like what you're doing with your entrepreneurial spirit and your business spirit and with your foundation and all the things that you do to give back, I think you really are attacking those identity issues and saying, man, you are more than just a football player. You know, I appreciate that. Um, I'm not going to lie. When I retired, I, I struggled for a solid year, like 
finding my identity, finding what I wanted to do, you know, because it's not, it's not, uh, it's not easy. You know, I've always been one that if you, uh, if you have a backup plan, you're planning to fail. So I don't really want to say I'm going I'm to fall back on this because if you plan to fall back, you're going to fall back. Uh, but being able to, you know, find myself outside of football, you know, I think that really happened once I started having kids. You know, I realized life was bigger than just, you know, going to work, going to practice, going to games, you know, studying playbooks. You know, I had to get up in the middle of the night and feed a bottle to a baby. You know? <laughs> and it, I like, there's no other, no other choice but to do it. So yeah. once I started having kids, I started thinking about life outside of football and what I wanted to do. And then, you know, um, just being able, being in a group, a, a group of guys that, that creates a, a network of positivity, you know, um, it, it makes you want to be better because you see everybody else being better. I tell people all the time, the people that I went to college with are lifelong friends because they're all doing something positive. You know, uh, one is a, a manager of a hedge fund. One is, um, a fireman, you know, everybody's got their own level of success. You know, I played football, but we're all doing something positive. Nobody's in, in the negative right now. So it can be done, you know, being able to find what you want to do outside of football. It may be going after football, going to trade school and becoming a mechanic and getting your own shop or, you know, investing in real estate, you know, anybody can do it. You just got to be able to, you got to be willing to take that step. And I think that's the hardest part us as football players, we're ingrained to be on a schedule and to know that, okay, at 6 a.m. we got conditioning, 8.30 we got a meeting, you know, noon we got practice, 3.30 we got more meetings, you know, so we're on a, a conditioned schedule from the time you wake up to the time you go home, and then when you're done, your schedule is what you make it. Yeah. You know what I mean? Whether it's college or football, your schedule and your life is what you make it. So I retired at 32, and I'm like, I'm not going to sit on my butt for the next 50 years. I got to <laughs> figure something out, you know, and then my wife was getting tired of me. She was like, you going to play golf again? I'm like, I don't, I don't know what to do. Either I'm going to play golf or I'm going to play basketball. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. And then the bills don't stop once the money stops. So you got to continue to figure out that stream of revenue and multiple streams of revenue. So, I mean, it's, it's one of those things that takes time. I'm not going to lie. So I had it figured out as soon as I retired, but it takes time, but it's definitely possible. You know, it's, you said so many good things there. Um, and one of the things you talked about, about being a team and, and a force for good, right? Mm -hmm. I have said, especially in the times that we're in right now, Mike, and I've said, I said it four years ago at Baylor, but I said the world, a football team, a team can teach the world a thing or two about coming together for a common good, for, for a common goal, different color skins, different backgrounds, different socioeconomic backgrounds different experiences, yet you all come together for a common good and you love each other. You bleed, you sweat, you pray, you play, you do it all together, man. And I think now more than ever, athlete, athletics, football players, athletes, whatever it may be, man, we can teach the thing. We can teach the world a thing or two about coming together for a common good. We definitely could. I mean, it's, it's so much out here that's negative, but it's so much positive that comes in the sports environment. Yes. You know, being able to to hold hands and and walk as one, you know, is certainly better than everybody being separated. You know, the old saying that you can break a finger, but it's hard to break a fist. You know, being able to to um, just have that type of bond, you know. But it, I, I will I will say that it it is different relationships, different personalities. Like on the football team, like I'm not gonna lie, I didn't get along with every player I played with, but I respected them. And that's all you can ask for is respect from, you know, people outside the world. So. Mike, <clears throat> uh, something else you said that I thought was great, too. Is you talked about, uh, and, and, and I took it from something you said, is really stepping outside of your comfort zone. I have to challenge myself on this all the time. The magic happens outside the comfort zone. It does, I, I don't, it's not that I have absence of fear. It's that I look fear in the face. I've got a shirt, a friend who has a company that says kick fear in the face. It's like, I always say it's like a wave, you know, you know, it's coming. You can run from it and get smashed by the way where you can ride that wave. Talk to me about some of the magic that's happened for you when you got out of your comfort zone. 
Um, I mean, just being one, my entire career, you know, um, was out of my comfort zone. You know, just being able to, um, one, I went to college at Coastal Carolina, you know, when I had, had other big school offers, you know, which what could have what could have been easier to um, make it to where I wanted to be. But I, I felt something special, you know, and that wasn't a comfortable decision for me. But going to a school that had just started their football program, you know, but hey, I, the ending was the same. Um, you know, just my wife is another thing that happened to me that's a blessing that I stepped out of my comfort zone because I'm not I'm very outgoing, but when it comes to women that I'm interested in, well, <laughs> back then, way, way back then. No, <laughs> but when it comes to women that I'm interested in, I'm I'm kind of like a shy guy. I'm the, I'm the guy that'll sit on the wall and like eye you down to make sure you see me, but I won't go say anything. So I did that with her for a couple months. Then I finally was like, you know what? I got to go. I just, I got to do it. You know what I mean? And we've been married almost 10 years now. Yeah. So, I mean, just being able to step aside your your pride, whatever it may be, your your feelings, your your fear, you know, that yeah, that inhibition to to go for it, you know what I'm saying? Because you only live once. Yes. If you want something, you see something, and you can make it happen, go for it. If it doesn't work, I mean, you went for it. You say, hey, I tried. You yeah. know, every time I talk to um, kids a lot, and one of the things I always say, and I don't even mean to bring it up, I always say, reach for the moon. You know, if you don't reach for the moon and you don't make it, you're still amongst the stars. So oh, I love it. And everybody else. You know what I, I mean? It. And it's one of those things where it's necessary. It makes you feel better when you reach out of your comfort zone and you actually accomplish something because then you're not full of regret. Yes. You hit the nail on the head. I lost my... My mom did cancer about a year ago. She had a 10 month battle and, and I'm, I'm, God has let me mentor a lot of people um, through their own stuff. Thank you. And, and one of the things I tell them and I tell anybody is the most, I think one of the hardest and most impactful emotions is regret. Mm-hmm. You, you know, Kobe Bryant didn't think he was bless his heart and that family was going to slam into a mountain that, that foggy Sunday morning. You don't know when your last moment is. And so, you know, people ask me that are, that are battling, you know, terminal illness or whatever it may be. And I said, you know, take the trip, go back, pick the flower, say you're sorry, love hard, forgive harder, like whatever you need to do not to live with regret because it will eat you alive, Mike. And I love that you said that. Oh, yeah. I mean, regret is, is, is definitely a, a real thing. You know, um, I don't, I don't think, because I've I lived in the moment so much that I don't think I regret much. Um, I always, because my wife, she's re- very big on pictures and making sure she catch, catch the moment. Yeah. I'm like, just put your phone down and just enjoy it. Smell the roses. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, I'm, I'm, I, like I said, I live in the moment. So when it comes to the point of being out with the kids or um, at, at basketball games with my kids, she's like recording my daughter running down the court. And then she goes, what happened? I was like, put your phone down. You'll see she just scored a butt. A you know what I mean? Like, live in the moment. Everything doesn't have to be recorded or on, on a yeah. video. So um, yeah. she's gotten better with it. But at the same time, I understand and I know who she is. All right. So you got to tell me, where were you eyeing her? You got to tell me the story about how you met your wife. Like, how you okay. Because I always say to my players, and I've been saying them to the, to my kings and queens across the country, even more so during quarantine and what's going on in our life. I say, yeah. shoot your shot yeah. during the quarantine. I'm like, Mike, you got you got producers, you got you got all sorts of people, you got their attention. Everybody is at home. Shoot your shot. So you got to tell me the story about how you met your wife. All right. Well, it took me a while to shoot my shot. I ain't gonna lie. <laughs> Um, so one of my, one of my real good friends, Giles Tucker, he was, he played with San Diego Chargers with me when I was there, his girlfriend at the time and my wife, they're best friends still to this day. So I was always around Giles. Giles went to Wake Forest University. So, I mean, I knew him before I even came to San Diego. Um, so I was always around Giles. We were best friends, me, Giles, uh, Paul Oliver, rest his soul and Antoine Applewhite. We were always together. Um, and his girlfriend obviously was all like around, but her girlfriend was with her. And I'm just like, every time she come around, I just 
you know how you like you don't you get butterflies, but you kind of like you get choked up and don't want to say anything. And like, <laughs> I would just see her and I would like I I say you know wave hey how you doing that type of thing, and then it was a few times that we were all out you know at clubs or whatnot, and we would dance have a good time, but I would never like shoot my shot. I would never pull the trigger, you know and like really start a conversation. So it was one time we were at um, at his house and I, it was a weekend during the off season. So we had been drinking, you know. Yeah. You know, I was feeling good. So I, I said, you know what, forget it. I went and sat down right next to her and we just, we, it just, it was coming out. I, I felt like I had a good mouthpiece that day. I was, I was giving her all my best lines. We was talking, she was laughing and, um, yeah, we got married two years later. Athletes, I have, I, Mike, have been so encouraged, so encouraged by athletes using their platform across the country, man. I, this is what we teach in the movement. You were not born for you, right? right? Like, you, it's, it, you weren't born for you. That's, and once you get that in your head and you rinse and repeat, you rinse and repeat, sometimes we get up all in our flesh. But once you realize that, it changes everything. But I tell them, I say, you've got a platform. Your gifts, your athletic gifts are a platform for you to be able to change somebody's life, reach down, help somebody, touch somebody. Your foundation is about families. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm curious your thoughts, seeing so many young athletes and, and athletes that are in the professional world starting to step up, speak up, and use their platforms to affect greater good and affect change. How does that make you feel, Mike? I mean, it makes me feel great, you know. Um... Normally, when, when you see uh, social change, societal change, you know, coming from athletes, it's normally from the higher ups, you know, the superstars, you know, the Kevin Durant, the LeBron James, Dwayne Wade, Chris Paul, those type of people. But when you have people that are not on that level, but still have some type of platform, not millions of followers, but yeah. 60,000, 6,000, you know, every voice counts, you know what I mean? Every every vote counts <laughs> um every if you can impact one person you made a difference yes and, you know lebron james he is the epitome of what it means to be change you know he is what we look at as a model of this is how you change people's minds this is how you change people's future i mean to go back to his hometown and create a free private school for students give them automatic tuition to college. He's changed so many kids' lives for the better just because he believes in himself and his ability to change them. First, so first you gotta turn that switch on in your own mind to, to know that you have the ability. And like, I can't change 2,000 kids' lives like LeBron can, but there's a kid that lives down the street that plays with my son that his dad's not there, so he can come to my house anytime he wants. I'll preach the gospel to him. I'll, I'll, you know, show him how a man treats a woman when he sees me with my wife. I'll show him, you know, he would play football and basketball with us. He could do all the things with me that he would do with, with his normal father. You know what I mean? So it's one of those things where if you change one, you're helping. So you don't have to be superstar status to be in that light. Man, you got me all teary-eyed over here. Um because fatherlessness is, is a huge issue. And yeah, right. we got to change racism. And yeah, we got to change uh, systematic racism. And yeah, we got to change inequality. And yeah, we got to change hate in our heart. We got to change all these things. And I really, and I'm, I'm going to get to it in a moment. I, I really feel the winds of change are coming. I do. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's what I'm holding on to in a dark time, holding on to that positivity and to that hope. But I love, I love that. I love that you're saying, hey, reach one, teach one, because it's the same thing, you know, I do with, with I'm changing the narrative. I have a couple of my guys, different guys that say, hey, you know, Miss Rachel, my dad's incarcerated or, you know, he's just getting out after 18 years. And so I have men that I've vetted, Mike, that are good, strong, upstanding men, businessmen, part, you know, fathers, whatever that may be. And I say, hey, would you like me to connect you to a mentor? You know, y'all, there's, there's no rules, there's no regulations. And um, you guys, if you want to be friends, if you want to look at him as a big brother, as a dad figure, but you always know you have a man to go to, to ask questions, to bounce things off. 
And, and to me, because there's, and somebody asked me that the other day, they said, you know, there's only, what do you do, Rachel? Cause there's only some, some things you can't answer as a man. And I'm like, right. yeah, this is my small contribution, just like you to try to combat fatherlessness and try to say, Hey, listen, there is somebody who loves you, who wants to be there for you, who wants to give you that man advice. And I just, I love that, that you recognize that that young man, whoever he is, needs to see how you love your wife, needs to see how you are a father and you will, you're, you're forever impacting his life. Exactly. I mean, that's, that's one thing. Like, I've never had that. You know, I saw, obviously I saw my uncles, well, my uncle loved his wife, which is my auntie. I, I saw the way he raised his children, you know, and that's where, really where I, I got my blueprint from. If it wasn't for my uncle Therry and I wouldn't really know how to be a man, you know? I mean, he played football. He was the provider of his family. He takes his family to church. You know, he prays with his family. Um, he is what I model my my manliness after. You know what I mean? He he handles business when it's time to handle business when somebody's getting out of line. You know, and I do the same. So I mean, I he taught me, and he's uh, family by marriage. You know what I mean? Yeah. He's been there since I was nine, ten years old. So that's how I learned. So I mean, it's only right that I share what he's he's given me to the next generation. So my son obviously will have it. If he don't, I'm gonna have an issue with it. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, all of <laughs> all of his friends that come to the house or they are always around me, they will understand that there's a certain level of respect that you give to every person. 